Hey friends, my name is Steve Guttenberg. This is the Audiophiliac Daily Show. And today, well today it's all about the Dyn Audio Contour 20i. Obviously the improved version of the last go round when it was the, just the Contour 20. But seriously, it's actually a pretty substantial improvement. But before I get to that, just do a little detour here and remember that about a year ago, I reviewed the Dyn Audio Evo 10, which is like the baby brother of this guy. And I love that speaker. I said, wow, this is sort of an entry level high end speaker for about, I think, $1,500 or $1,600. And it was, it, it took me for, you know, it took, put me through some changes because I think, I thought I knew the Dyn Audio sound. But the Evo 10 was, mm, step up. And it was great that it was in that affordable package. This guy here, the 20i, well, it's substantially bigger. This is a fairly large stand mount speaker. It's 17.3 inches high. It's about 13 inches deep. I will list the specifications below. But it's a, it's a fairly big speaker. It weighs 30.7 pounds. It's beautiful. I think it's a stunning design. The paint, this is a um, black gloss. Superb, absolutely superb. But you can also get the 20i in walnut or light oak. Uh, and I've seen those finishes on other Dyn Audio speakers and they're just fantastic. But to get to the particulars, well, the, the tweeter, it's an Esitar tweeter. Matter of fact, this tweeter on the 20i is derived from the series up from Contour, which is called Confidence. So it's, it borrows a lot from the Confidence Esitar tweeter. So, that says a lot. And I'm going to tell you about the tweeter later on in this review about its sound. The woofer is, uh, is a 7.1 inch uh, silicate magnesium polymer driver. I think I got that right. And it's, it's interesting that it's 7.1 inches because usually drivers are 6 inches or 8 inches. This one's 7.1. In any case, you can feel that, you can feel that, uh, that size, that 7.1 inches. Uh, make uh, itself known when you play music with bass. This speaker's bass response, considering it's not a floor standing speaker, it's just a large stand mount speaker, I was getting bass down to the mid 40 hertz range in my room. Now the front baffle is uh, skinned, you might say, with an aluminum piece. And the drivers, the tweeter and the woofer are bolted to that piece and then that piece is basically bonded, maybe I'm not using the right word, to an MDF uh, backing. That's the front baffle of the speaker. Sides are nicely curved. The back panel, it's, oh, it's a ported speaker as you can see here in this picture. The binding posts uh, feel deluxe as befitting a price. You know, and by the way, speaking of deluxe, this speaker is made in Denmark in the Dyn Audio factory. They're not outsourcing parts from different suppliers. They make the drivers in-house. They make the crossover in-house. The cabinets are done in-house. It's all made in Denmark. So the price, I've told you that part, the price is $5,250 a pair. Impedance, some important specs. The impedance is four ohms, so it's lowish. And so is the sensitivity, it's 86 dB. Now that means you should use a serious amplifier. It doesn't have to be the most powerful amplifier. I used it with a 30 watt per channel pass labs into four ohms, it was fine. But if you want to crank, if you want to party, uh, you should use a substantial amplifier with these speakers because of the low sensitivity and the lowish impedance. Getting to know this speaker, well, you know, it's so, well, refined. It's so easy to listen to. No, it's a zero fatigue experience listening to this speaker. That's one of the things that I kept noting in my notes that it was so easy to listen to at quiet levels, at medium levels, at loud levels. You play it louder and louder, there's no sense of increasing distortion or strain or listening fatigue. These things don't occur with this speaker. You know, I was just playing. Uh, this Eno record, uh, Spinner, and it's, a, it's you know what it is? It's a, it's a really interesting record because it's not like heavy into production like a lot of Eno's later records, but it's, it's, uh, it's Eno on synthesizer and Jaw Wobble on bass, mostly there's other musicians, but there's a lot of Eno just doing synth stuff. 
and the bass goes down deep and these speakers can handle that and really strutted their stuff with that speaker with that album and then I played Led Zeppelin 2 just to reconnect with my youth and you know I cranked that puppy up and you know it's not the best sounding recording a lot of distortion I don't mean the good kind I mean the bad kind and it can be irritating it just can be but it's such an, a, a, a landmark record for me and a lot of people of my generation generations that followed I remember I used to take Led Zeppelin to hi-fi stores was when I was going to buy a speaker or an amplifier or something I would that would be the first record I did and I did that in my 20s and probably into my 30s I used Led Zeppelin 2 as one of my go-to reference records not because it was an audiophile recording but because it just touched me in that way you know that records can can do when you're a teenager they stay with you for a long time and here I am uh, long past being a teenager and when I play Led Zeppelin 2 <laughs> yes it still has that thing it still has that that magic so then to take it down a notch I play this guy here this is Stan Getz Charlie Bird it's 1962 it's a live to two track recording just stunning Wow, it's one of those uh, you are there experiences. The band is right there. They're just grooving. They're doing the, you know, the, this bossa nova thing. It's all about the groove. It's all about the flow of the music. And it's so perfectly formed. Uh, Stan's saxophone is just right there, complete. Just com <laughs> it's all there. Wow, the whole band. I just, everything about this record well it put me in a good mood I started out in a pretty good mood and then playing this record I just I felt relaxed I felt at ease <laughs> and I was so into the sound I am an audiophile after all I'm not just the audiophiliac I am an audiophile and the sound of this record which is one you know I feel bad I had been playing this for years it was one of those stuck between other records in the wrong place kind of deal and I pulled it out it was, so my estimation of the 20 eyes just went up a couple of notches when I played this record because it had that kind of effect on me. The Getz record is a minimally produced affair and that's why it works so well. So it, in contrast to that, I'm into contrast, I pulled out this record, Mancini Touch. It's a big RCA production, I assume, in Hollywood. Lots of instruments, brass strings, you name it. Everything's going on all at the same time. And yet, and yet, and it's a, you know, this record was made about the same time in the early 60s. The clarity and the space of the, of the group, of this ensemble, is just wow. The, you know, it's, you, I, you don't hear records like this anymore. I'll sound like an old guy. You, they don't make records like this anymore. It's like the, the talent on display on this record, just the ability to have all those musicians. You know, these records were not made over, you know, weeks or months like, like rock records. And all this music on this LP was knocked out because these guys were pros, and you hear that in the grooves on this record. I, I paid $1.99 for this record. It's an amazing condition, just incredible. And like I said, the contrast between the sound of this very highly produced record and the Stan Getz record were, were startling. And the 20 eyes were making all of that very clear. So this guy, this is another old record. And I'm done, uh, after this, I'm done, if you need to fast forward, uh, you can just fast forward. But this is another old record. This is an original Rolling Stones with the 3D cover. This is Santanic Majesty's Request. This is uh, the Stones' answer to Sgt. Pepper. And you know what? I think it's a more psychedelic record than Sgt. Pepper. It's really weird. It's, the, it's Brian Jones, who's the other guitar player next to Keith at this point in 1968 or so. And uh, it's dense. It's very, very dense. And the 20 Eyes sound staging abilities are extraordinary because you just get this layering, depth, space, sound coming out from different places. Really, really impressive. Very impressive. And I love this record. I, I can't say I always did, but as the years have gone by when I wasn't expecting it to be like the other Stones records, this record just gets better and better. And by the way, the reissue, the remastered 50th anniversary that came out a year or two ago, 
actually sounds better than this. This is one where I'll say this original one isn't as good as that one. I just happen to have this one closer, so this is the one I grab. But if you're into the stones and you've somehow overlooked Satanic Majesties, check it out. It's really, really interesting. It's not just another Stones record. So, so all th through all of these recordings and many more that I'm not going to bore you with, uh, that tweeter, that one inch Esitar soft dome tweeter, I think that is uh, the not so secret sauce of this speaker because it has this effortless quality and the high end is definitely not bright, definitely not dull. But it's so um, clear without you know making a big deal out of it. So you just hear into those high frequencies, which kind of make it, it adds a sense of height to the stereo image. You just hear this um, clarity and harmonics, and and again, as I turned it up louder and louder, no strain, just just an effortless increase in volume. But beyond that, that's a crude way of describing uh, what's so spectacular about this tweeter. It's just that those, those highs are so pure. It's such a rarity. You know, the last one I heard that did that, well, the last one I, I heard that really struck me about the highs was the Golden Ear Technology BRX stand mount speaker. That used, used a folded ribbon tweeter, uh, an air motion transformer, if you like. And that one also, but that, but that tweeter was a little more showy than this one. That one was more like, look at how these highs are just, this one is like, no, I'm not gonna call attention to myself. This one just presents that kind of detail, but in a much more subtle way, which makes it easier to listen to over the long term. I made a turn here, and then I, I did some home theater stuff, two channel home theater, and uh, I used this movie, A Cure for Wellness, it's from a couple of years ago. And it's, it's one of those uh, scary psychological freak out kind of movies where this guy, he's in Switzerland, he's in this sanitarium for sick people who never leave, that kind of deal. And the, the thing about the, this movie that's so intriguing is the sound design, the sound mix is so multi-layered there's creepy things going on in the in the background that's you're not really aware of but they're there it just makes you uncomfortable and you know in a good way you're watching a creepy movie it's visually stunning the acting is really great but it's the sound it's the it's the score that just add up to this um experience that's just when you hear this kind of thing over a really high-end system like this it just takes it to another level you know, when I do reviews like this for the last year or two, I've always been using a Past Labs XP30 as my preamp. And I did for much of this review. But I also swapped out the XP30 and used the Carry SLP98 tube preamp. It passes a solid state. And I, when I use this tube preamp, the 98, the, the imaging was more um, dimensional. There was more substance to each musician. They were more fully complete. And I would go back to the XP30, and they felt leaner, thinner, flatter. And, and having that two preamp in the system changed things in that way and added a little lower mid-range warmth. Uh, it just completed the sound in ways that I felt I really liked. Now I liked the, it wasn't as accurate as the XP30 and that's why I was bouncing back and forth between the XP30 and the carry. So um, again, you gotta, it's a season to taste kind of thing. And, and as for power amps, well, I, I, maybe for the bulk of the time, I was using a first watt F7. It's a class A low powered amplifier. It's 30 watts into four ohms and that seemed like a good batch, especially with the carry preamp. But that's only 30 watts a channel, and these are low sensitivity speakers. So I also spent some time with the big Pass Labs XA 100.5s, they're 100 watt mono blocks. And yeah, those definitely up the ante in terms of dynamics and impact and bass prowess, let's put it that way, right? So yes, power makes a difference. So if you're into the loud thing, 
definitely plan on more power than less. But if you're a more, uh, oh, I don't need to crank it kind of guy or, or lady, the 30 watt Class A amplifier just adds uh, its own this, you know, that 3D, that, that texture that I find so appealing. So look, uh, the price. The price is, as I said earlier, $5,250 a pair. It's a lot of money. And for that kind of money, you could buy a floor standing speaker. I know that some of you are saying that to your screen right now. For that much money, shouldn't I get a floor stander? And the answer is maybe. But the thing is, that money invested in a floor stander may not give you those things, that refinement, that low coloration, that low, uh, that listening fatigue, that freedom from listening fatigue that this speaker can give you. That, a speaker with more woofers is going to give you more bass impact. There's no doubt about it. But not everybody's looking for the same thing. If you care more about refinement and purity and clarity and transparency, and you prize those over power delivery, uh, yes, then the 20i would be uh, worth considering. Now, my main reference speakers are a bit more. They're the Klipsch Cornwall 4s. They're $6,000 a pair. But they're much bigger speakers. They have a 15-inch woofer, bighorn speaker. For a lot of people, that cabinet, <laughs> the Cornwall 4 cabinet, is just too big. It's a big thing to have in your living room or whatever. So just for that kind of, you got to live with this stuff, right? So it might just be too big. But as, as much as I love the Klipsch, it's not going to compete against the Dyno Audio in terms of the things that I just enumerated, right? purity, transparency, holographic imaging. It doesn't do that. The Klipsch doesn't. But uh, what the Klipsch does is ha it's more of a live concert feel. It's more forward. It's more exciting. It's more dynamically alive. Switching back to the, the 20i, it feels, it feels like a smaller speaker because it is. If you need power, if you want impact, if you want to really crank it, if you want to have a concert type experience at home, get a big speaker. No doubt about it. Hey, there you go. I think I've done it. My name is Steve Guttenberg. This is the Audiophiliac Daily Show. If you, if you like what I'm doing here, please subscribe to this YouTube channel. We just hit 150,000 subscribers. I'm so proud of that. I think it's fantastic. If you still have some time here, check out the Patreon, which can be found at p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash audiophiliac. If that's not enough, we got more. We got playlists. We got playlists for speaker reviews like this, and I'll, I will link to the Dyn Audio Evoke. But there's, a, there's playlists for speaker reviews, and headphone reviews, and electronics reviews, and of course, music reviews. Not to mention, but I will, interviews. Interviews with Dan D'Agostino and Harry Weisfeld from VPI and John Atkinson, Andrew Jones, Nelson Pass. They're all here, right here, just a click away. And now I can say my work here is at last complete. Thank you so much for watching. And I really do hope to see you back here again very, very soon. Bye-bye.